Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Doing Business in Bentonville. My name is Andy Wilson. I'm, a, I'm your host today. I have a co-host with me today, Michael Grain. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Andy. Pleasure it, to be here. It is so good to have you. Michael, this is our second podcast together. Yeah, except I was on the other end before. You made, you asked me all the tough questions. Sure. Now I get to ask I questions. I did, and <laughs> now you're going to ask a lot of questions, you know? And, and again, it's, it's so great to have you joining us today. Our special guest today is Tom Lucio. Tom, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Oh I mean, we connected. We worked together at Walmart. Worked mm. together at the Soderquist Center. Oh my! Uh, and it's just been—it's been too long since we've yeah. had this gap. But I have really enjoyed yeah. your podcast. You've done a great job with these, oh. and I'm real honored to be on here with you. Well, you're very kind, but it is an honor <laughs> to sit across from you again and visit with you. I will tell you all this: something we have got such a great podcast today because we're going to dive into so much history. Uh, but the great thing about what's going to happen today is the leadership lessons that this man's going to share with us across this generation of learning that he has had. And you want to lean into this podcast today because, in fact, you know what? You want to keep it and take some notes and, uh, and apply some of this learning you're going to get today. So, Tom, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's so great. Let's dive into this straight away. Because we just need to get into it, Michael, because there's so much here, as I said already. So let's do it. So, Tom, talk about P&G. Uh, let's go before 1987, okay? Talk about Procter & Gamble. Okay, well, just give me, let me give you just a little framework of what was happening in the retail industry, because that makes it relative. There weren't any national accounts except for Sears and Petty's, uh, and Kmart was coming up. But Sears and Petty's didn't sell consumer products. Uh, Kmart was was a, a five and ten cent store, grew into Kmart, mm. and then at the same time you had the other five and ten cent store, Woolworths, Ben Franklin. They were fading away, uh, and you but you had these new discounters that were coming up, like Walmart and Target. Other regional mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. club stores were just starting. Mm. Super centers were just starting. But the, at the time, the bulk of the uh, consumer products companies' business went through grocery stores. Mm. And you had, at those po- again, you no national company at that point in time. You had multi-regional chains, and then you had independents uh, mm. that were serviced by either IGA or Super Value. Mm. So in 87, we were dealing with a, a very fragmented retail market but one that was in huge transition. Mm. So, and at that time, so that was the background. Mm-hmm. P&G was the number one consumer product company in the world, uh, and then obviously in the U.S. We were organized in eight different product divisions, mm-hmm. and each one of those divisions were autonomous. I mean, they could, they were separate from each other. Uh, all the invoices said Procter & Gamble, but we were really eight faces to the to our retail customer, which was very confusing and frustrating because the terms weren't always the same. Uh, mm-hmm. But yet, wow. uh, that's that's the way we went to market. In fact, I had a colleague who said P and G was a Mercedes that we broke up into eight bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, the each of these. Uh, consumer product division mm. had their own retail sales force of mm. about 500 people. So eight times five. Mm. And we were calling on almost every retail outlet mm. in the U.S. So I, I uh, describe it as we had the biggest infantry mm. yeah. <laughs> in, in the in the consumer product retail uh, landscape. Yeah. Now, Tom, what what was your role during this time that you're describing? Well, I was the national sales manager of the food division. Okay. And uh, and so I had, you know, uh, responsibility for the 500 people mm-hmm. th- that were selling the food products. And you were lived in Cincinnati. I Liv- got you at Liv- the Liv- home Liv- office, right? Liv- the Liv- home Cincinnati. office in Procter & Gamble. Yep. One of the largest consumer product companies in the world. Right. At this time. And uh, you, you guys were looking at a little company called Walmart. Right. Well, they weren't so little, but <laughs> the issue was, as P and G, our 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 philosophy was: we'll do consumer research to find out what people want mm-hmm. in products. 
we'll do product uh, development and manufacturing to create ser uh, superior products. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we will create the market by our advertising. Okay. And then we will control the in-store conditions right. through this massive sales organization. So, all right. So you're in Cincinnati. And then somewhere around 1987, you were asked to take on a major, major project for right. P&G. Yep. What was that? And unpack that for us, okay? okay? Well, at this time, also just to let you know, we considered retailers to be a convenient pickup point for a product. <laughs> they weren't really... Well, how times have changed, right? <laughs> uh, our philosophy is we'll create the product yep. and the demand. You do what we tell you to do, yep. and you'll just enjoy the profit. Okay. All, All right. right. So that, now, that, wait a minute. Not, yeah. to, not to take you off here, but I believe <laughs> at one point in time... Mr. Sam Walton actually gave us an award that our CEO wouldn't even accept. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, that comes a little bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but, okay. This is so interesting. I, I mean, to tell you, you know, all of us have worked at Walmart, right? And, and then, and you both at Procter and Gamble. I just got to see Procter and Gamble from the outside, which wasn't really pretty at times. And we'll get into that but anyway. So, uh, <laughs> but here we are. You you are about to ask to do something that Procter and Gamble's never done. Yeah. I mean, it was it was brand new. Right. It it was probably scary for you, all of you, because you were you were about to look into this this retailer that was growing, and and had huge plans to do what what they've done today. And what blows my mind is that Michael last year they did a hundred billion in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Now you know, so here we are. So Tom, how did it feel? How did it happen? Describe us this. When you were asked to do, do this in 1987, describe that to us so we know how you felt. Okay. Well, Who asked you and how did it feel? So walk us through that. Yeah. Well, well, we had a new vice president of sales and he said, I don't understand. We're, I don't understand why we're having, why our relationship with our customers is so, he had come from the Philippines. Okay. So why are, why is it so adversarial? Mm -hmm. Why is it so transactional? Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. We should be working together. He's talking about P&G and, 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 and retailers, and retail work in right. specific. So he said, well, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out of the food division. That I'm going to put you in charge of a multifunctional design team. And this is an 86, 87. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell us how we should go to market successfully with our customers in the year 2000. That's what your charge is. Okay. Okay. So, Tom. Here you are, you've been given a challenge, and no challenge like, oh, this is no challenge you've ever had at, at Far From Gamble, right. right? All right, so what did you do? Talk us through that. Well, we had this multifunctional team, and we would get together, and we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at, uh, study P&G, we're going to look at our strengths and our gaps. We're going to look at our competitors' strengths and gaps. We're going to look at companies in other industries their strengths, their gaps. <clears throat> we're going to go through every function, and we're going to say, what's the leading edge thinking in this function? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to put all of that in a bucket, and we're going to then say, here's the way we think we need to go forward. Mm -hmm. What we were able to do is we were able to get what was called a steering team, which were John Pepper, who was the president of P&G mm -hmm. US at the time, mm -hmm. and we had representatives from each function but higher up than, mm -hmm. than, than our team. And we would meet with them every two weeks, and we would share, here's what we learned, and here's what we think it means. Mm -hmm. Now, that didn't mean that they were signing up, right, but right. it did force them to dialogue. Sure. Uh, because, see, from P&G's point of view was, we're winning. Why do we need to be changing? Yeah. Just leave it alone. All right. Uh, and uh, we were missing a lot of things. We didn't, we weren't really understanding what was happening with technology. Mm-hmm. And we really didn't focus on understanding what was changing in retailing. Mm. And at that time, total quality was a big yeah. thing in industry. I remember uh, Edward Deming got yeah. that over from yeah. And so Ford and other, how could other companies do, were using it. Yeah. How could you do systemic uh, improvement if you didn't include your customers? Mm -hmm. So those were some of the things wow. which we um, were considering. Then we came back with a recommendation. The recommendation was we need to go 
to with our to our customers uh, multifunctionally. We need to go as PNG, but without losing the expertise we have on the categories and the brands. Mm -hmm. But systemically, we need to be one company mm. so that it works for the for our customers. Mm. We need to co-locate with our customers, and um, we need to figure out how we can integrate yeah. systems between the two. Mm. Uh, now, I mean, like, mm. like, I uh, remember making that presentation, and the, num the, the level of support I got from the C-suite was you could have put them all in the mid-sized car and uh, <laughs> still had room for luggage. Okay, <laughs> there weren't the, this was, and so people said, "Isn't that nice?" One this cute little group did, mm -hmm. and they put it off to the side. Mm -hmm. But we do have we what we were smart enough to do because uh, our advertising department they knew how to do things like focus groups, mm -hmm. which we didn't know how to do right. in sales. Well, they did this focus group of the people actually doing the work between P and G and Walmart, which clearly demonstrated how broken the relationship mm. was. And that was something that was wow. very instrumental going forward. Wow. And, well, and just so you know, for the yeah. audience, we actually have saved that. And we're going to go ahead and play that now and let you guys see the relationship between P and G and Walmart in 1987-88. So we're going to have to play that. We're not on net pricing with Procter & Gamble on most items. And uh, we continually have counting problems, not to mention all of our confusion trying to keep up with the myriad of deals that are going on. We pretty much know the items are going to sell. Uh, it's just all the other little things that are the distractions. My secretary will uh, spend probably a half a day making appointments for one set of POs to all nine DCs. We found that a couple of the Walmart warehouses now are only letting you schedule so many appointments at one time, yeah. then you have to call back the next day to schedule the balance. I've got a girl who spends two days a week doing nothing except Cuban, Procter & Gamble, Trussell. I think there's a lot of bugs. We need to work out of this fast response program. At one time, I remember six separate uh, appointment times for one truck. And, you know, at the other end, the distribution centers, they're, they're getting a little less happy every time we call. As large companies, I think we're convinced if we don't do business in a complicated manner, we're not doing it right. You could spend your time on trying to figure out how to uh, sell more product instead of whether you interpreted the deal sheet properly. Quicker decisions. Uh, let's not go up and down the ladder four times. Let's do it once. And uh, they need to give us a chance to do the things that we can do those. Just because we've never done it before doesn't mean that we couldn't do it in the future. So, Tom, I remember those days very well. Um, we remember that P&G was very, what's nothing broken here? We're growing yeah. sales. What's the problem, et cetera. Meanwhile, people like us on the team were right. getting beat up every single day. Right. right. Summarize for us kind of the working relationship between P&G and Walmart back in 1987-88 when we started. Well, Sam would make the comment that if he wanted to punish one of his buyers, he'd put him on the P&G business. <laughs> I was to God true quote. Sam, but Sam was so desperate because we were the largest supplier. Yeah. He said, I've got to find a way mm. to get this relationship working with P&G. Mm -hmm. So Walmart had this prestigious Vendor of the Year award. Mm -hmm. So he said to the buyers, has anybody come up with anything we could give P&G credit for? Mm -hmm. Someone came up with something. So Sam was going to give us the vendor of the year. He calls our CEO, mm -hmm. but who was that? Who's the CEO? John Smale was the CEO okay. at the time. All right, uh, and it was later a huge supporter and everything. But mm -hmm. at the yeah. time, his administrator mm -hmm. wouldn't put Sam through. Our CEO didn't talk with customers, and she didn't know who Sam Walton was. Mm -hmm. So they transferred him to, around to the various uh, national sales managers in the eight division. Finally, he got frustrated and gave the award to somebody else. <laughs> But that's in the lore, and we, uh, John Smale still laughs about, or when he was still alive, he, yeah. he laughed about that yeah. uh, as, as a real thing that happened. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, uh, I think that, you know, your, your point is on the video was how, you know, uh, Walmart was very honest, you know, and, and the individual at Walmart, and, and I, that's what I love 
about the no, the thing I loved about the video, my takeaway on this, Michael, was that you know Walmart was honest, P and G was honest, and that's critical of getting to solving the issues. Yeah, it's, it's the honesty that took place. Honesty uh, was uh, with each other. We didn't see that the world the same way. Mm -hmm. the The cultures were different, but the values were the same. And right. the values being the same in the two companies really allowed us to to make uh, terrific progress mm -hmm. uh, as as we were able to go uh, forward on this. So, um, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, yeah, what what yeah. was able to happen when we mm. we were honest. Mm -hmm. We had we had two principles that we established. That one was, um, and it, one of them was, it doesn't matter who's who's right. It's more important to do what's right mm -hmm. and. Let's make sure we understand mm -hmm. what we're dealing with so that we're making decisions based on yeah. facts, not on emotions mm -hmm. and, 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 and past history. Well, you know, that Put principle is on yeah. the table. Well, you know, it's, you know, guys, that principle is so true today. I mean, mm -hmm. it's still so true today. It's, it's doing what's right. And now we would probably add not only what's right, but what's right for the customer, mm -hmm. you know, because now we're so all so focused on the customer. Today and Sam was, I, I give credit to Sam on that, Michael. You know, he taught us that at Walmart. Right. He, and well, every time he got in front of us, he said it. Wasn't mm -hmm. it? So what else, Mike? Uh, at, well, and the other uh, thing that uh, we did talk about sure. all the time was what are the issues, not the positions, oh. because it was real easy to say, yeah. here's our policy or here's the way we do yeah. that. And we started out both Walmart and PNG thinking the other company would be better if they did it our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we tried to convince each other yeah. why that was the best way. Right. But then when we would back up and say, well, what's the issue yeah. we're trying to solve, not our position, it was much easier yeah. to, to then take the solutions yeah. worked the P&G way, they worked the Walmart. There were some blend of the two when we're yeah. really focused on the issue. All right. All right. There was a lot of change going on. And I was still pretty green in my career. But, but Tom, you had salespeople that you were flying in for all different parts of the world, covering different sectors who are now moving their families to Northwest Arkansas. You had finance people, you had IT people, you had logistics, customer service people, you have store operations. You basically were trying to build something new and completely change how P&G went to market with a customer that was pretty frustrated with their relationship. So where did you start? How did you address, how did well, you get started? The, uh, the fact is that um, we realized that the relationship as we started was being driven by a buyer and a salesperson. And the rest of the company, these had talent in both these companies. They weren't anywhere in the relationship at all. Mm -hmm. But yet we needed all those functions in order to make decisions in each of the companies. Mm -hmm. So we started out <clears throat> by the first thing we had was the two CEOs were very courageous. This was not a popular idea. Mm -hmm. This was not an idea. Uh, P&G didn't want to do this, didn't think it would work. And Walmart C, uh, senior executive didn't think P&G would ever change. Mm -hmm. So why even bother? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we started off with that support, which was terrific. Then we established um, what we called as a, a multifunctional mirror team. We took people from each of the two companies that had the same, so IT to IT, finance to finance, mm -hmm. and we formed, that was our leadership team, mm -hmm. that mirror team, mirror functions. I like that. And yeah. we that then allowed us to get start to get better understanding. Mm -hmm. Well, why do you do this at P&G? What's the benefit? Why do you do this at Walmart? So we started, we found out we really didn't know each other very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the vocabulary. You know, we called, Walmart was an account. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. I have an account at the bank, but I'm a customer. Mm -hmm. When you say customer, mm -hmm. it's a totally different um, mm -hmm. uh, impression. They called us vendors. Made me laugh because I thought of the vending machine in my fraternity. Mm -hmm. We put your money in, yeah. have it a four-arm sugar, yeah. and sometimes you get your drink and your money back. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. but, but anyhow, <laughs> and then with this mirror team, yeah. what we did is we did co-design. We said if we were... Oh, because Sam said to us, he said, if you thought of my stores as an extension of your company, mm -hmm. we would do business entirely differently. Wow. So that became the mantra. If we were one company, what would we do differently? So we called it the one company model. So this mirror team, which wow. think of us as like a board of directors, we said, okay, if we were one company, what would we do differently? 
And so we came up with a joint vision, a joint mission, jo uh, shared strategies, shared objectives that would play in both companies. So you could go down our objectives and things we're working on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one-sided at all. Both companies wanted to improve profitability. They wanted to improve market share. They wanted to simplify, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so drive out costs that aren't adding value. Mm -hmm. Then we then we started sharing data. We have data. Walmart had data. We put it together. It was magic, the things that appeared mm -hmm. that we could do. Uh, and then from that, we started testing various theories that we had. Mm -hmm. And then when if they worked, we would expand them. If they didn't, we would say, did that not work because it was a bad idea? Or did that not work because we didn't do it right? Mm -hmm. And if it was still believed it was a good idea, mm -hmm. we try it a different way. That was Walmart. Try it, do it, fix it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then we measured everything. Anything that was important in Walmart, that was part of the measurement. Anything that was important to P&G. So we, we didn't want to have any unintended consequences. And we knew we were going to have to do a lot of internal selling back to our constituents. Right. And so if you didn't, so I wanted to be able to, you know, if it was cash flow, if it was inventory turn, if yeah. whatever it happened to be, we measured everything. Right. Uh, and that allowed us to do the internal selling to enroll more and more people to give us more and more rope mm -hmm. to to make this thing work. Wow. that <clears throat> That's excellent. I mean, that process that you developed that communication, uh, that learning, those values or, or principles are you know, the, all the same. You know, um, Tom, what you just laid out is success steps for most companies, most companies. Yes. I mean, that's a powerful presentation mm -hmm. right there, Michael. I will tell you. So, Tom, now, that was still in the late, uh, 80s, right? All this was taking place. It was right. just the timeline. So, right. In the, so, because now, because they gave you several years to work on this. Right. Right. So, where were you in that timeline uh, of what you just described that you all built together? Well, this was an ADI. We, we yeah. The design okay. team was like about 18 months before okay. then. All right. And, um, and then uh, when uh, uh, the two CEOs got together and said, we, when they got together at a total quality meeting, mm -hmm. and at the end of the total quality meeting, Stam stood up and said to P and G CEO John Spale, "Let's do this." John said, "Let's do what, Sam?" He said, "Let's do this total quality between our two companies." Wow! And John said, "I'll get back to you." Well, we were the only recommendation going, so yeah. they said, "Let's bring out this rec. We'll try it for a year. It won't work, but at least we'll get credit for trying something new." Right. Wow. So that was. I mean, both the Walmart group I and mean, the poor Walmart group, as you know, this was extra work for them. Mm -hmm. They still had their regular day job. Right. We were dedicated because uh, we were we came mm -hmm. and we were going to be working just on the Walmart mm -hmm. business, but they were doing their functional stuff and then doing this on top. Mm. Wow, that is that is that is so powerful. And I, I hope one of the things I hope our listeners and viewers will get from this. Is what you're because what you got you guys are going to get into the results here in a moment and get into some of that, but just the background that you've done, you set that up so well, and and the initiatives. Is there any other issues or uh, organizational structure that you want to talk about before we get into results? Anything else you want to well, capture was, there? Just to show you how we didn't understand each other, we didn't really understand how the stores worked. The whole yeah. operations, the, your, your area, mm -hmm. was brand new to us. Okay. How powerful operate. We didn't, we didn't really understand uh, it. Right. Walmart didn't understand the, the difference between commodity products and, and superior products. So we, we yeah. would go to Cincinnati. Yeah. They would see the labs. They would see all the right. – we, they would take us in the stores. Mm -hmm. and, and initially, everybody who worked on our team worked three days in a Walmart store. In everything from mm -hmm. night receiving to stocking shelves to front end, so that we could understand better mm -hmm. uh, Walmart. So I mean, it, wow. there was real a lot of learning wow. and a lot of openness, uh, yeah. but it was very, very different and very strange. Right. I mean, here I am. I'm in, in the advertising department. Wow. We don't talk to customers to start with. <laughs> now you put me down here to work with a customer, and my career is on the line. And then you put me in a store for three days before I can even do that work. 
Grace, Grace Thornton. <laughs> Mark, we, we, uh, we, I want to. I'm going to ask you to tell a story here in a second. This is so great. It, tell you a story because because two things came real out of it. Number one, Walmart was not our customer. What we realized is the person that bought Todd yeah. in Walmart was our customer. Yeah. We changed that perspective. Yeah. It, cha- it was no longer an argument between us, but what's the right thing for them? Yeah, but I'll never remember our finance manager, Kathy Blair, after she walked a store with us. We all went, oh, that was interesting. That was it. She goes, I got it. I got it. You remember what her quote was? Yeah. What was she her quote? Their stores are profit centers. Yeah. And we went, <laughs> so? <laughs> so? What's that? So we we, yeah. we we spent this time down here, and we would yeah. meet at night and yeah. review mm-hmm. what we heard. And we, I said, she said it 10 minutes later, their stores are profit centers. I said, we got it, Kathy. See, it's on the scripture. <laughs> Five minutes later, she said, you don't understand yeah. Their stores are profit centers. I said, I'm getting a little cranky, Kathy. Uh, I'm going to give you two minutes to explain it. Yeah. She said, we send our money to Walmart as, off, as bill back. We don't send it off invoice. So I, if we give a $2 allowance bill back, it goes to the buyer's account, and the store gets billed at the regular price, but has to sell it at this lower price, mm-hmm. which makes it a negative margin mm-hmm. for the store. Even though the company's getting, mm-hmm. if my competitor has an allowance of half that size, mm-hmm. it off invoice, they look better in store for merchandising because it's got a higher margin. So then I said, okay, well, then we're going to ask them what happens to those $2. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, that goes in the buyer's account. We can use it however we want. And I said, theoretically, then you could use that on our competition? Yes. I mean, yeah. talk about opening eyes. <laughs> Uh, and we didn't want to do off invoice because yeah. we didn't trust our customer. We wanted to prove, yeah, yeah. if you're going to earn the money, we want to have yeah. proof that you earn, yeah. then we'll give you the money. Yeah. So I used to laugh if we had a relationship that the legal departments were owning. Yeah. We wanted you to perform twice for the money, and you wanted the money without doing anything. <laughs> so so we did as a test. Yeah. We did as a test. Yeah. He looks at me and goes, Mike, can we do that? I go, yeah. For six months, we ran all of our allowances, not a bill back, which basically when the buyer's open to buy, mm-hmm. it went directly to the store's P&L. Yeah. Directly to the store P&L. We did it for six months, and they were like, this is the best thing we've ever done. So yeah. we figured out how to do this stuff. Yeah. But that was an example mm-hmm. of IT, supply chain, Tom Muccio, the stores of the profit center. So what? What? The, that's yeah. not. No, you don't understand. Listen to me. That was just our team. Yeah. yeah. Because. Everybody knew their their square, mm-hmm. but we had no idea of how the difference. Yeah. It's like a thousand piece mm-hmm. jigsaw puzzle. If yeah. you put the picture the outside of the box, yeah. everybody had a piece. If you put yeah. the pieces yeah. together, you got what the picture looked like, or we wanted it to look like. Wow! So, did it work? What were the business results? Did Walmart win? Did P and G lose? Did P and G win and Walmart lose? What were some of the business results on both sides? I think there's, there's so many. I'd be here all day, but. Uh, we, we together we built the business from three hundred and fifty million dollars. Fifteen years later, when I retired, it was eight billion. That starts to be real money where I grew up, and that's a like a twenty seven percent compound annual growth rate. And in two thousand three, the P and G Walmart business alone would have been a two hundred and thirty fourth biggest co- company on the Fortune five hundred list just our relationship together. When we started, Walmart was losing 5% on P&G goods. Mm-hmm. Profitability, because, partly because of the store being the profit centers, partly because of comping, uh, mm-hmm. partly because of the way we did our promotion money. We didn't do net down pricing mm-hmm. at the time. It was high, low. When I retired, the margin was 15, positive. Mm-hmm. So it's 20 margin point difference. Mm-hmm. In, in and on on eight billion, that's a hundred and sixty million dollars. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, wow. And we've had scores of innovation breakthroughs. We did. We, we created an inv- industry standards. But one of the biggest things was the people development, mm-hmm. because both companies were the people working together. We, some like someone took the veil away, and we could see a much bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Every one of the mirror team members from Walmart became officers of the company. Mm. And they will. They all said one of the big reasons they were able to do that is because of what they learned. And mm. P&G, we had the same thing. I mean, pe- the growth was just enormous mm. on the people. Mm-hmm. And, and then both companies 
were able to reapply uh, the learning. Walmart was able to reapply to other suppliers. Mm. P&G was able to. So it was we were inventing and then mm. and, and then reapplying. So it was it was a wonderful mm. wonderful uh, dynamic uh, that we created. Wow. Tom, Tom, we've uh, you retired in two thousand and five of three. 2003, so sorry, 2003. Let me start that again. Tommy, you retired in 2003. And from the day you retired, we gave you your six or 12 months of, you know, go lay on the beach and dictate on the beach or whatever you wanted to do. And a year later, we said, Tom, when are you going to write a book about this? The world needs to hear this story, Tom. And you were the one that led this story. Well, I can finally say, yes, we've actually written a book and you have written a book. Uh, tell us about the driving factor about writing that book, what it's called, mm -hmm. uh, when it's available, all that kind of stuff. Because you, you do a really good job of laying out the entire mm -hmm. uh, relationship history. Well, it's, the book is called Collaborative Disruption, mm -hmm. which is descriptive in and of itself. It, it is. It's available for pre-order now. It'll come out in uh, in, in the 1st of November. And uh, it the beauty of the book is I, I go into the backstory. What was happening in both of these companies mm -hmm. At the time that then they got together, mm -hmm. we started dating, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then how did that play out to uh, to a, it's been now going on for 35 years, and it's still successful year after year after year. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, I wrote the story because it's it's really a transformational story for the industry and beyond about collaboration, the power of genuine collaboration. Also, I wanted to highlight the courageous leadership at the top of both companies that was required to make it happen mm -hmm. and the unbelievable courage and effort of the people on Walmart and P&G, mm -hmm. the pioneers who actually made it happen. It's their story, and it deserved to be told. Um, and uh, the other reason I wrote it is I'm really a zealot for collaborative relationships. They're just so much mm -hmm better way of, of leading a business and developing people. Hmm. Uh, so, and I, I, I had really bad, kind of like five audiences in mind. One was CEOs. I wanted to challenge them at the opportunities that they're leaving on the table by not working strategically mm -hmm. with their, with their, or not working collaboratively with their strategic customers and suppliers. Two, anybody who's leading a team, because the dynamics of both teams together and the individual P and G team, great lessons there. Mm -hmm. Great lessons to aspiring leaders. Mm -hmm. It's a history book as well. It's, it's kind of like mm -hmm. uh, you know inventing the light bulb or or, mm -hmm. or you know making cars on an assembly line. I mean, it's it was a different. It was an, yeah. something that happened in history. Plus, I think we made it a really good read. I think if just if you picked up the book in the airport and read it on a plane, you wouldn't be disappointed. You, you'd find it because there's there's plenty of humor and there's it's a lot of it's a lot of truth in there as well. Mm -hmm. True stories, but they're humorous stories as well. Uh, Tom, congratulations on the book. Uh, we're excited. We're excited for you to pick it up. Some and and there we'll make sure we will share all that information with you on our podcast and plus our website and all that. We'll do that because we want you to pick up the book. Uh, but I, I, Tom, I think what you, you have done, you, you have, and, and thank you for bringing that story. Cause you know, we learn through great stories. That's how we learn. That's how we remember. That's how we retell, you know, right. critical points is through stories. Right. And I think this is a book, Tom, that, that it's a story, right. as you said, and I th as leaders beginning or wherever you are in your career, this is a story that can help you move forward through almost any obstacle. You're right. And and because you had so many obstacles in front of you, your team, you and your team. And so, Tom, what you did, you and your team at Procter & Gamble, the team at Walmart, you all also created the next generation of suppliers to Walmart and Sam's relocating to Northwest right. Arkansas. Right. right. Now, we live here. This is a great area. Right. And the supplier community is phenomenal. It's over 2,000. It could be 3,000 today of suppliers that are here supporting Walmart and Sam's. 
Without your story, that would not be possible today. And I will tell you, Walmart or Sam's probably wouldn't be as successful as they are today, nor would these supplier companies be successful. That's right. And, but you said something, too, that, just, that I thought is just needs repeating, is that look at the lack of learning. That's the biggest thing, the right. lack of learning that would not took place, the lack of developing leaders you mentioned that would took place right. because of this decision. And the success of that you've done. So as we think about now over 2,000 plus suppliers here in Northwest Arkansas serving Walmart and Sam's. And um, now we know where Walmart is today. It's unbelievable. Right. Their future is unbelievable. As I just mentioned at the top of the show, uh, we spent a lot of time on Omni Channel here doing business in Bentonville. And, and uh, as I mentioned, Walmart, $100 billion in e-commerce alone last year, uh, 30%. Uh, quarterly our, uh, growth on top of 30% growth uh, uh, quarterly right now. It's, it's So it's just, it's unbelievable what's, what's happening at Walmart and Sam's. So what would Sam Walton think? What, did, he, did he vision this? Did, what do you think? When Sam brought all of you, you know, he was very instrumental in getting you together, getting the, supporting this. What do you think of it? What would Sam Walton think today? Well, I think he, he thought that if he could get P&G to change, that that would lead to other people changing. Right. I didn't, none of us envision all these teams coming down here. And yeah. when the first, after, when a couple of the success drove, a few other people wanted to come down. And I remember Walmart sending out a memo, you do not have to relocate your people here. We're not looking to do that. Yeah. You put your people where you think that, but yeah. because of the success... Yeah, it, it 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 you had to do that, and then yeah. now you got the same thing at Target. You got the same thing at Costco. Yeah, I mean it's now a way of doing business yeah. in the industry of having multifunctional yeah. people get together face to face and wow. innovate, test things, try things. Yeah, uh, and and again, as Mike mentioned earlier, that we had one of our CEOs, A.G. Laffley, codified it. He said, "We have two. There's two moments of truth. The second moment of truth, P&G always focused on. How well does our product work mm-hmm. versus our promise when you take it home? Mm-hmm. But the second moment of truth, which is really the first moment mm-hmm. of truth, is what happens in store mm-hmm. when someone's trying to make a decision mm-hmm. on what product to buy. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't win the second moment of truth right. unless you win the first one." But that then helped Walmart and P&G codify, yeah. we're, we're going after the same customer. Wow. It's the same person. Yeah. Uh, and we yeah. a, and they have, Walmart wanted to make it a pleasant, that was all about the experience and whatever. Yeah. And then when the products yeah. were sold, we wanted to make sure that our product was the winning product in the home. So many defining moments. Yes. So many. That it really changed the industry. It changed, yeah. it changed everything, is what, what you're describing. And with these, again, I just go back to the principles you laid out. You know, they're, they're simple, but yet they're complex, but yet they're the truth. And because of great leadership in both companies, they were able to accept the truth and then do something and change. Yeah. And Sam always taught us, you know this, Michael, Sam always taught us the most consistent thing in Walmart was change. Mm-hmm. And he asked me, he asked me one, day, one time when I, I, when I was running Human Resource, he said, A.D., can we, can we put change on the valuation? You know, I went, <laughs> let me get back to you. We need to talk to you with our attorneys, of course. But, you know, let me get back to you on that. But, but that's how much he believed it. We wanted to evaluate people on change. Was he knew that that was the critical piece of all of us cha- being a, a student and change and, and change being consistent. We just never stayed in the same thing. Yeah, Walmart it, was known for having a low resistance to change. Yeah, but you blew that up too. I mean, that's the other thing. You used that. Well, the, the beauty of it was the strengths of each company. Yeah. For instance, Walmart, we used to laugh and we said, Walmart is ready, fire, aim. Okay. <laughs> We were, okay. P P and G was ready, aim, aim again, 
change the scope, <laughs> aim again, and fire. Now, there's strengths in both of yeah, them. There is, the yeah. closer you get to the target, the more yeah. bullseyes you'll get. Right. So, 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 so yeah. doing the analytics yeah. and yeah. that's good. But if you don't get, you know, you don't teach swimming by reading a book, you got to get in the water. Yeah, well, uh, that's good for it. And uh, so yeah. we were able to take the strengths of both, yeah. both companies. Uh, mm. I mean, I learned so much at Walmart. I, 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 for yeah. the first five years I was here, I attended every Saturday morning meeting except when I was on vacation. You know, I remember you always at those Saturday morning meetings. And, and I was the only uh, supplier there. You were. And I was I was wondering about that. But then, you know, they begin to share, the merchants begin to share with us at our uh, Friday um, merchandise meetings. They begin to share with us, after some period of time that you all were working, some success. You know, they talked about the overall approach the mer merchants did, and but they waited a period of time. And then when you all begin to make some, some success, to begin to talk about it. And to begin to share the ideas at the merchandise meetings. Then with the Saturday, I think Sam called on you a right. few times. I, yes. I recall Sam calling on you a yes. few times at the Saturday morning meetings to talk about right. what you were doing. But again, if you think back, and, and as again for our viewers, that's the communication, the sharing of information, the, this try fix it idea. That was all what was happening in the support that was happening. Throughout the organization, you know, all the people in the organization, ultimately you had to get the support of our store managers. Right. And and you all, and, and, and that that's a, just a great story. But there's so many more stories. I know, Michael, we, we need to talk about yep. some other great people that was part of this. Absolutely. So so I think the one thing that, to, to me, whether it was Sam Walden or now Doug McBillan, they both have an absolute tenacious for change. Yeah. And it's just not to change. Yeah. The reason you want to change is because the customer changes. Mm -hmm. You think about 1980, Kmart and probably Sears were the number one and number two retail. Well, for all practical purposes, they're not around anymore. So the reason for change is not to just change. The reason for change is to meet, continually mm -hmm. try and meet that customer's demand. I think you stay ahead. Once you slip behind and not keep that in front of you, you're going to be in trouble. But, well, I, I think the one thing that I want to make sure that we hit is we actually had – uh, when Mr. Sam passed, we had Lee Scott become his CEO. And when, uh, uh, Tom, you actually invited him to our P&G Walmart team huddle, probably had a you know 100 people or so in the room. And Lee came in and said, let me tell you my side of this whole P&G Walmart story from the float trip to the total quality training to all that kind of stuff. And we're actually very fortunate to have that video. So we're going to play that video now and see some of the things that he captured as some of the key levers. The P&G, I was in that first meeting. It's one of the great thrills in my business career to have been in the meeting in Cincinnati with Sam Walton and the P&G leadership and to see this thing start from what was an adversarial relationship that was built upon each company doing only what was good for them and absolutely having no tolerance for any kind of cooperative effort. Uh, and I've seen it evolve into individual relationships that many of you have with people that are really friendships. And, and it has made a difference at Walmart. It's made a difference in the relationships that we have with other suppliers. And if you think about us being the world's largest company and the criticism we get for our failures and the criticism we get for our supplier relationships when we have a failure, Think of what the circumstances would be today at Walmart had we not made the kind of improvements we did make and had we not developed the strong relationships that we do have, whether it's with yourself or the Gillettes or whoever else. Fundamentally, that meeting changed Walmart stores in many ways and made us a better company. I will tell you also, I believe that it made P&G a better company. P&G had great products, they had great marketing, but they knew both of those things. And that's really, really dangerous for any of us. So Tom, obviously that's pretty impactful. Um, it, from his side of the story, what's your thoughts on some of his comments that he made? Well, he he, he makes the, the point, which is a, such a valid point. What we did made both companies better by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when you put that mm -hmm. the better together, it really was explosive. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, we've done this globally now. We're, mm -hmm. we're in... We've got 
P&G Walmart teams all around the world, every place that Walmart operate. Yeah. We've got people working at the various mm -hmm. omni channels. Mm -hmm. So we're, we are, uh, so Lee was just spot on. And he was, uh, for the 15 years I was there, I got to work with him through various mm -hmm. uh, assignments he had up through and including uh, his CEO. And, you know, as an example, he and I would meet once a, once a quarter in his office, brown bag, and we spent a couple hours together talking mm -hmm. about trends, business results, implications. I mean, if, if it was today, Lee and I would be talking about what is the impact of deflation mm -hmm. and how should mm -hmm. what do we need to do differently yeah. as prices come down. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been that's the kind of things we would talk about. Mm -hmm. And then we would say, Well, what about well, why don't we test this or why don't we test that? And so it was just a, it was a mm -hmm. fabulous relationship. We used to take the, uh, the C suite from both companies. So you'd have finance people talking with finance people. Mm -hmm. We would do, we call them top to tops. Mm -hmm. And then once a, once a year they'd get together and they would compare. Well, here's what we're. Well, how are you handling this? Mm -hmm. And so the it, we're peer companies. Here we're mm -hmm. peer companies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, yeah. so if 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 you we, we could change we could share data on. Uh, on recruiting, people development, yeah. career pathing, executive right. compensation. I mean, right. there's just so many things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that are beyond just the buying, selling of product. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had P&G people come to Walton Institute, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, and I remember um, as a store manager going to Walton Institute and then all the way up being in charge of it. But I, I remember... You know, we would have uh, the first group I remember was the uh, a bank group. Uh, you know, our best bank group came, and then the next one there'd be others. I think P and G was the first supplier right. group that yeah. came. Yep, and then others began to come, and because we seen the power of this learning together and this cross pollinization of ideas. You know, it, it just it made both, as you said, it made both companies better. We had a P and G college that had offered various right. courses, and I had many Walmart executives yeah. go with me to, to to a particular course that was right. be beneficial to them. Uh, and the the CEOs, right on down, yeah. you know, from Sam and John Smell, right through, yeah. they would walk stores together. Right. They would the, they would visit in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and do go to the various labs mm -hmm. and so forth, and so the. We, we developed a powerful friendship right. uh, as well. As, and then many things turned into industry standards. Mm -hmm. We would invent something together, mm -hmm. and then we, we make it uh, an industry standard. Mm -hmm. It's much more efficient for everybody. Right. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was kind of like if you take routine stuff and you mm -hmm. first you simplify it, then you standardize it, then you mechanize it. Mm -hmm. and, right. And then... It, you could spend your time on things where value added makes a difference. Mm. Okay, Tom, one more time, the name of your book. Called Collaborative Disruption. Okay, such a great name. And that book's going to be available at Amazon, Walmart, wherever yep. books are sold. Uh, it's available for pre-order now. Okay, well, let's do it. All right, there you go. Pre-order, and let's get that. I can't wait to read the book. Okay, and and uh, I know the author, so you're going to sign it for me. Okay, <laughs> so you know, but Tom, I will tell you, we have we have wonderful guests here at doing business in Bentonville. I can't remember a time that I've enjoyed more today to have you and Michael here in the studio talking about this, reliving this moments together. Right. But the thing about what that you you all have discussed is. This is something that we need to relive to learn, continual learning. You yes. know, one of the things that we all have learned, we have to be continual learners. With this book, with this information that you all have shared today, this this is a continual learning moment for all of us. Yeah, there's gold in them there, Hills. Yeah, yes. But it's messy sometimes. Yes. It isn't easy. Right. And it takes effort to maintain it. Yeah. But by golly, it's worth man, it. The man. results speak for themselves. Yeah. Tom, Michael, la any last closing comments? Well, for me, I'm uh, just saying I would recommend people to think about uh, the opportunities they have with collaborative relationships with their customers and suppliers. Mm -hmm. And that CEOs, 
are willing to legitimately sponsor that kind of work mm -hmm. and give people an opportunity to have a seat at the table, mm -hmm. to be able to make some decisions, try some things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's very powerful, and it, it's available. Mm -hmm. But as I said, it, sometimes it's messy, yeah. and, some, and it is not easy, yeah. and it's hard work to maintain, but the, it's really, really worth it. Wow, it sure is. Michael. Michael, thank you for being a co-host today. Mm -hmm. um, it's always good to have you in the, in the podcast. You know, we talked about you and I doing more podcasts, so we got to get that done. We do. Okay, all right. So I wanted to call you out here on that. Okay, okay. so pressure's on. Yeah, we, that's right. So <laughs> any any closing comments, Michael? Um, I, I think this has direct reapplication for lots of different businesses. Um, I, I know that I've been very fortunate to take what I've learned and transfer that when I'm working with Nordstrom's or Dick's Sporting Goods or Kroger, and these principles mm -hmm. work there as well. Mm -hmm. Multifunctional. I think we actually had a T-shirt once that says, the fact that we're a multi-sector, multi-brand, multifunctional mm -hmm. is not the customer's fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not their problem, right? Yeah. And so these these are really complicated times, but you've got to be mm -hmm. really focused on what's important, Keep your, mm -hmm. make sure you keep your customer in front of you, because that person can, as Mr. Samson, can fire you anytime by spending their money somewhere else. So to the degree you can do that, and obviously Omnichannel is a great example of Walmart kind of being out front in that and thinking through that, not knowing where the customer is, but where they were going, um, the brilliance of that, and obviously all of the support that they got right. for that. I've come up with another. <laughs> Uh-oh, this is good. <laughs> another term called corporate fog. <laughs> yeah. Corporate fog. Keeps oh. the C-suite from seeing what it's really like yeah. to be a customer or a supplier of their company. Yeah. And I joke and say, if yeah. most uh, companies had to be a customer of their own, mm -hmm. one of their top priorities would be find another supplier. And, you know, I'll say, when, here's my thought on fog, corporate <laughs> fog. You're exactly right. But, you know, yeah. when you turn your lights on brighter, it is it, you can't even you see less through the fog, right? And that's what happens. Yeah. You know, the, it gets brighter, and now we're really on a loss. Yeah, we don't know where we are. Well, I then you had, if you had, use an airplane example, if it gets too far, you best thing you do is you turn around and you fly back. <laughs> well, yeah. that's not exactly going to help you either. Necessarily. <laughs> the other thing the fog is there too. The people doing the work, they're waving their hands. But, yeah. yeah, but the C suite can't see them. They're yeah. yelling. We're we're yeah. There are pain points here. Yeah. There's opportunities we're missing. Yeah, that's so right. you got to blow Very that fog cool. away. Yeah, uh, by by legitimately working yeah. together, and that's the whole idea of a mirror. The one thing that yeah. Walmart was good at showing yeah. P and G how we were. Yeah, and we were good at showing Walmart. There's yeah. some great things, but there was also yeah. some things we didn't do well. Right, and right. things Walmart didn't do well. Right, but that was the truth. That was the element yeah. of truth. You look in the mirror. And saying, gee whiz, I'm, my hair is getting a little thinner, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Because the mirrors don't lie. Right. <laughs> Sometimes you see the real problem when you look in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom, um, can you come back sometime? Absolutely. Okay. I want you to, because uh, I had like four or five ideas during this podcast <laughs> I want to talk to you about after this. <laughs> hey, to all of our, our viewers and listeners, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we want to thank you not only for listening and watching our podcasts, but... We're right now, because of you, we're in 36 countries, we're reviewed in 36 countries. Thank you for that. Continue to share this on all the social media platforms. You know, we're on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and beyond. So check us out there. Always check our website, too, because every day now we're updating information on our website. That's doing business in Bentonville.com. Thank you very much, everyone. Again, thanks, my guests. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. <music>